started. So good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this uh, event. My name is uh, Dorothy Alain Dupré. I'm the head of the Regional Development and Multilevel Governance Division in the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. And I will be very happy to moderate this uh, event. So we, we have uh, many pa participants from all regions of the world. Uh, so I would like to, to warmly welcome you all. The purpose of our event today is to launch the report, uh, the access and cost of education and health services, preparing regions for demographic change. This report is the second and final report of the project Understanding Present and Future Public Service Delivery Cost financed by the ECDG Radio. We launched a first report in March this year on delivering quality education and health care to all. So I would like to thank, of course, DG Radio for initiating and supporting this very important in, and innovative work. The report is the product of a very fruitful collaboration between the OECD and the LUISA team at the Urban and Territorial Development Unit of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Let me say just a few words on why this work is particularly strategic and timely. First, most EU and OECD countries are confronting challenges in public service delivery in some regions due to demographic changes, but estimates are missing on the scale of the challenges. This project helps fill this gap. Second, regional challenges will be amplified in the coming years and decades. Demographic change will tighten the trade-off between cost and access to education and health in rural areas. Third, the pandemic highlighted structural weaknesses in some of our regions and countries for public service provision in health and the recovery and the massive fiscal support from governments provide a unique opportunity to build more resilient regions, better able to address future shocks. To achieve this, better understanding the priorities for investment in health and education is critical. For all these reasons, this work is extremely strategic and timely. So this afternoon, we have a very interesting program. We'll start with a short video introducing this, uh, this work stream. Then we will have opening remarks from GRC Director Stephen Quest and from CFE Deputy Director Nadine Hamad. The authors of the report will then present the main findings and introduce a new interactive tool to explore and access the data produced by the report. Afterwards, we will have a policy panel with the participation of four speakers from three countries, Chile, Estonia and Sweden. Following the panel, presentation will close with remarks by Sabrina Lucatelli, Vice Chair of the Working Party of Rural Policy at the OECD, and Lewis Jekstra, Head of the Economic Analysis Sector at DG Radio. So I would like to mention to the audience that you can ask questions at any point using the Q&A uh, function that you see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, don't hesitate at any point, and in particular, to ask questions during the policy panel uh, discussion. So without uh, further ado, let's start. So with the, the video presenting the, um, this, this work stream.
thank you. So we are now pleased to have a few introductory remarks by video from Stephen Quest, Director General, European Commission Joint Research Center. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to take part today in the launch of the report on access and cost of education and health services, the joint work by the OECD and the European Commission's Joint Research Centre. Understanding opportunities and obstacles to the provision of basic services to citizens, such as education and health, is key when designing and implementing effective policy response. Hence, I'm convinced that this report can contribute to shape a fair and just recovery for all citizens in all the places where they live and work. There are several challenges for our territories in doing this. It's in remote areas and sparsely populated territories where the challenges are most acute and where the provision of basic services is under most pressure. There are trends such as depopulation, ageing, climate change, which have unfolded and which question not only the accessibility and affordability of basic services, but also the actual survival of the most vulnerable places. Public finances are also under pressure making it very challenging to find long-term solutions that would guarantee the provision of schooling and health services in regions where settlements are rare and difficult to access. On top of all of this, the COVID-19 pandemic is not quite over yet. So what then is needed and how can this report inspire us? Well, first, we need a territorial vision. Evidence shows that one solution does not fit all. Policy generates impacts on all territories, but in an uneven way. Therefore, the place must be at the core of our actions and policy solutions must be consistent and tailored to the characteristics of each place. Second, we need a holistic, integrated approach to planning. The more complex the challenge is, the more important it is to ensure a coordinated response across different territories and policy fields. We should align all of our efforts so that governments at local, regional, national levels all act together in a coordinated way. And third, to transform vulnerable territories into attractive places, we need to mobilise three key enablers, innovation, education and culture, so they work together in ecosystems of opportunity and prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that cooperation such as this one between the European Commission's Joint Research Centre and the OECD are essential to raise the knowledge curve for the benefit of all. And my thank you goes to the scientific teams who work hard behind the scenes of this impressive publication. I wish you all a very fruitful discussion. So I would like to, to thank very much uh, Stephen Quest and, and GRC for the excellent cooperation uh, throughout uh, the project. Uh, I will now give the floor to uh, Nadim Ahmad, Deputy Director in the Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, uh, Regions and Cities uh, at the OECD. Nadim, the floor is, is yours. Nadim, you are muted. You are on mute. Nadim, uh, you are. No, no, mute. no. I mean the the, 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 fa the famous uh, <laughs> the famous words that we now hear in this virtual environment. <laughs> so, so many thanks, Dorothy. I, mean, I, I wanted to perhaps start by uh, using the de rigueur lines that we now have in this virtual world. In addition to you know you're on, you're on mute at the moment to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Um, so it gives me great pleasure. To, to, to provide a few introductory remarks, in addition to the excellent remarks that have been made by Stephen, um, to launch this joint report um, by the OECD and of course JRC that looks at the access and cost of education and health services. I mean, it's the second, as Dorothy said, in a series of reports that we're producing within the OECD Centre for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities, under the umbrella of preparing regions for demographic change. And in our first report in this series, delivering quality education and healthcare to all, and this one I try to encourage you all to read, I mean, sets the scene for today's publication. It directly addressed the key challenges faced by regions, especially in remote and rural regions, that Stephen succinctly laid out, including depopulation, aging, and the green transition. And of course, it looked at opportunities, for example, through digitalization that could address these challenges. Now, in turn, the report set out a series of recommendations, and again, um, Stephen articulates these very clearly, which are, of course, also central to today's report. I mean, namely the, the need to ensure a place-based focus, the importance of cooperation across municipalities and indeed multi-level governance in general. And of course, the need to capitalize on and leverage on digital tools and innovation to materialize cost-effective responses. Now, today's report takes a, a deeper dive on the challenges around depopulation and aging in particular, 
and looks at their impacts on the provision of health and education services, arguably the, the two most important functions of governments, whether they're local or central. And, and through the prism of equity and cost, and to complement that earlier work, it provides groundbreaking data and evidence to look specifically at spatial issues concerning the location of schools and medical centers today, but also in the future. And, and to support this, the report is accompanied by, and I have to say this excellent interactive tool um, for visualizing and downloading that data and evidence for municipalities and indeed for regions in 27 EU countries and the UK. And you'll hear more about that, our findings, the data, the tool, um, very shortly from Anna, Chris and Mert. I mean, the three stars of today's show, and I want to take the opportunity to say thank you to the three of them for this excellent, really excellent work. But before we hear from them, I also want to take the opportunity of saying a few words to highlight why this report is so important and, you know, to help set the scene. So within Europe, 35% of people live in a region that has seen its population decrease in the last two decades. And this is happening disproportionately in remote regions and regions near a small or medium-sized city. And moreover, these very same regions are also growing older. Remote regions have seen the largest increases in elderly, elderly dependency ratios over the last two decades. And today, residents in remote regions in Europe are on average two and a half years older than residents of metropolitan regions. In France, Denmark and Lithuania, the difference is six years. And our projections indicate that these ratios are set to grow. By 2050, almost 30% of the population in Europe's remote regions will be 65 years or older. And this brings specific challenges for health-related services. Demand for cardiology services is, for example, already higher in rural areas compared to cities in many countries. Now, the flip side of that aging and its specific challenges for the provision of health services for the elderly is, of course, lower demand for other services, such as maternity services, and in turn, lower shares of the young, and in particular, school children. And this raises different challenges for the provision of education services. Now, while student numbers are expected to increase considerably in cities, they're expected to decrease considerably in rural areas in many EU countries and European countries over the next 15 years. Indeed, many rural communities in OECD countries do not have or will soon not have any children of school age. And these declines raise direct challenges for existing schools in rural communities and, of course, the provision of school services, especially when seen through the prism of public finances. Now, on average, the costs per student in primary schools are around 20 percent higher in sparse rural areas than in cities. And for secondary schools, the costs are over 10 percent higher. In some countries, such as Estonia, Finland and Latvia, costs can be 40 percent higher. So, so without action, depopulation is likely to see these gaps increase. Now, of course, one could take a draconian view to overcome these challenges by, for example, simply encouraging consolidation of services where it's most cost effective. But this ignores equity and indeed the quality of services. And this is a central, these are a central component and should always be of the way these services are delivered. Students in sparse rural areas already travel on average four to five times further to get to school compared to their counterparts in cities. And at least 40% of people living in sparsely populated areas in Europe live far from a medium sized health service location. In Sweden, Finland, and Ireland, for example, residents of sparse rural areas have to travel up to 60 kilometers or more to reach a medium sized cardiology service location. So, so what does our report do? I mean, using that granular demographic data, and indeed the data on locations of schools and medical centers and travel distances. It attempts to provide a view of optimal service delivery that's optimized around equity as well as costs. And what it shows us is there are enormous opportunities for efficiencies while still ensuring equitable access. For schools, for example, I mean, cognizant of the fact that there will be a somewhat inevitable increase in cost per head given shrinking school age populations in rural areas and overall lower economies of scale, our results show that the costs per student in sparse rural areas are expected to increase by around 3% of average, with slight increases in travel distances everywhere outside cities and proportionally more in villages. But, but that increase needs to be set against the, against the counterfactual of no change in the location of schools, where, for example, in primary schools in sparse rural areas, the increase will be twice as high and in villages 60% higher, whilst achieving only small accessibility gains compared to our projections. In countries expecting a sharp decrease in student numbers in sparse rural areas, the additional costs of not readjusting the school network to future demand can be much higher. 12,243 well, euros higher per student in Lithuania and 741 euros higher in Latvia. So, so what should we do? 
well, first and foremost, listen to the report, read the report, um, and, and have a close look at the, uh, at the interactive tool. Um, but in a nutshell, if I had to, to summarize, I mean, what we need to do is ensure strong place-based policy responses and strong municipal cooperation and multi-level governance that can anticipate demand changes. These changes to design an appropriate supply side response that can balance equity and costs. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, today's report forms one in a series of actions that will be taken to help regions prepare for, for demographic change. And there is scope to do so much more on this front. And this includes deeper dives in digital provision, another in its ways to deliver services, looking at the green transition, and of course, looking at remote working. All of these have implications for the way that we manage demographic change and its challenges. And of course, there are needs and uh, of course, continuing efforts to make sure that we double down on the data that can be used to support our evidence-based policy recommendations. And today's event, in particular, the interactive tool, is an, exact, an excellent example of, of just why that data is so important. And so with that, I'll end my intervention. Um, thank once again the JRC for their excellent collaboration and indeed thank the many others, including the delegates from the Regional Development Policy Committee for all of their excellent input and support for this work. And I wish you all a successful event. And with that, I pass the floor back to you, Dorothy. Many thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadim, for a very comprehensive overview and for highlighting that the report and the data set are, are really game changers to identify the scale of the challenges. And thank you also for highlighting some of the, the main policy recommendations uh, and solutions. So I will now turn to the team of the, of the authors of the report. So Chris Jacobs, Christiani, Mert Kompai from the European Commission Joint Research Center and Anna Moreno from the OECD uh, CFE. They will present us the detailed findings of the report and will also introduce the visualization uh, web tool. So Chris, I think you will be starting. Uh, the floor is, is yours, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dorothea, yeah. and thank you everybody for, for joining us. Um, I'm Chris. Uh, Mark, can you please go to the next slide? Um, well, as already said by, by Nadim, uh, we are expecting big population changes in Europe, in most of the OECD, uh, and we are afraid of, that these changes might further increase inequalities between communities in those countries. Uh, and we are seeing two major population trends, um, population decline, aging, and we think that they will affect rural communities above all. Um, so both population trends are relevant for the work that we are presenting. Uh, for this introduction, for this slide, we'll just focus on population decline a bit. Uh, on the left map, you're seeing population densities across Europe. Uh, this is basically a study area that we focused on. In blue, you're seeing high population densities. In yellow, you're seeing low population densities. And I trust that most of you will be able to pick out most of Europe's main urban clusters and, and periphery. Um, on the right map, you're seeing expectations of population change between 2011 and 2035. In yellow, places where we expect population increase. In blue, places where we expect population decrease. And it's quite easy to pick out substantial areas where we do expect population decline in, say, the Baltic countries, parts of Scandinavia, the southeast of Europe, uh, big parts of the, uh, the Iberian Peninsula. Um, in fact, we are expecting that about half of the European territory is going to lose population. Uh, and we are expecting that the worst population decline is going to happen in places that already have very low population densities. So why is this relevant for services? Uh, services such as schools, education? Well, in areas with low population densities, uh, we're already seeing issues with service provision. Typically people have to travel a lot further to get to the services they need. Uh, and the reason for that is scale. Um, services need a, a sufficient number of users to be able to operate efficiently um, by a process that we call skill benefits. Um, that sort of skill is easy to obtain in cities where it's quite easy to get enough users within a small radius so you can have cost efficient services within, you know, around the corner, basically. In rural areas, you need to have quite large service areas to be able to provide a service efficiently for users. And that means often that people will have to travel far to reach that service. 
um, come aging and population decline, specific services, uh, we'll see that the user base will thin, will be spread thinner throughout the territory. And that means that either they will suffer uh, in terms of cost efficiency, probably, or they will have to increase their service areas. Uh, so there's some major trends that we're seeing. Um, we therefore set off to quantify what these population trends really mean for service provision, right? Um, how costly would it be to sustain service provision at the current levels? Uh, or what would the travel implications be if, if, if we rearrange our, our, our structure of services? Um, Mark, next slide, see what So only one slide on methods, please bear with me. Um, the, so the focus of this project is on four services, um, primary education, secondary education, cardiology and maternity and obstetrics. Uh, we are interested in local costs and accessibility and to understand that we need to have precise service locations. Unfortunately, we do not have uh, current service locations for these services uh, in, in most of the OECD countries. And obviously we do not know future locations or costs of services. So we, we sort of do a modeling approach based on what we do know, what we can observe. Uh, so we do know service locations in some countries, we know demand in, uh, in, in local communities across uh, our study area, uh, and we do know how well these local communities are connected with each other. Um, and then we use the demand and connectivity of these local communities to try and reproduce the service locations that we know in a specific member states so using a modeling approach. And we then assess uh, how many people are using each of those services. Uh, using that, we model school and health locations across Europe uh, based on local demand estimates. And we did that for the current situation and we did that for the expected demand situation in 2035. So from England, we actually have data on costs of education, costs of providing health services and we use that to train our models and then have an estimate of how costly it is to provide services given a, a, a user base of a specific size. Um, so we use those health records from and, and, and those cost records from England to let's say make a model that is, assesses how expensive it will be to, to run a service uh, given a, a certain user base. Um, we compute those cost estimates for the current and the, in the future situation. Uh, for schools, we did an additional variant where we also estimated the cost if we would maintain the current uh, school network, but demand is changed uh, right for the 2035 levels. Uh, and we were able to map on a quite granular level uh, what the cost implications and the access implications are of, of fixed or not fixed school and, and, and health locations. Um, so those mapped estimates are done in a quite flexible way, allowing us to aggregate our results to any sort of geographical scope or geographical perspective. Uh, and we've used those results, those summarized results to, to give us some of the conclusions that we wanted to present today. Um, so without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Anna, who will talk us through some of our main findings. Thanks. Thank you, Chris, and hello to friends and colleagues in the audience. To discuss the results, let me first start with education and then I will move on to healthcare. Next, please. So for education with the methods uh, Chris just described, we obtain estimates that we can aggregate from a micro level, say from school and students, to the degree of urbanization, for instance, to understand geographical differences in cost and access. As an example, the figures in the slide show you the cost and distance estimates for secondary schools. And you can clearly see that both variables increase as density decreases. So this trade-off between efficiency and access really gets tighter in sparse rural areas. As mentioned by Nadine before, we actually estimate that compared to cities, annual costs per student in sparse areas are 20% or translating into euros, 700 euros higher for primary schools and 11% higher for secondary schools. And this cost difference can be actually way higher, over 40% higher in countries like Estonia, Finland, and Latvia that have high sparsity. These are in a way estimates of the unavoidable cost of smallness and remoteness in the sense that these 
cost differences are purely driven by geography and demography. And it is relevant to note here that previous studies had mentioned that costs and distances were probably higher in rural areas, but until today, we really had no precise estimates of this gap. Next, please. From a local perspective, the results show that in some countries, many small municipalities already have or will soon have only small schools that are spread over a large area and that run at very high cost per head. The graph that you see in the slide shows that more municipalities will face this issue in countries that have more municipal fragmentation, such as Greece and Spain, compared to other countries that have undergone a process of municipal consolidation, such as Estonia and Finland. From a policy perspective, consolidating schools can help reduce cost, but it also requires ensuring adequate transport for students that in many cases already travel long distances. In this sense, in assigning funding and responsibility, should, policy should really consider both sides of the coin, cost and access, especially in rural areas. Next, please. Finally, based on the future projections that Chris described, we estimate the changes in cost and access that are driven by this declining number of students in many countries. And what we find is that countries already facing high cost in rural areas due to sparsity will face even higher costs in the future, even if future supply adjusts fully to changes in future demand. Interestingly, the results also show that both demographic change and geography play a role. So it's not only about sparsity because the scenario is, for instance, very different for a country like Sweden that is very sparse, but that also is projected to grow in terms of population in the next decades. Next. So now on to healthcare. Uh, next, please. Before we go into the results of our project, it is relevant to point out that the available projections we have at the OECD show that as a percentage of GDP, health spending per capita will increase about two percentage points by 2030, and that demographic changes alone are responsible for one fourth of this change. So in this scenario where demographic change and other structural factors will continue pushing uh, health expenditure up, we focus on a limited part of health provision that has to do with specialized services. Like Chris mentioned already, this will be cardiology and maternity and obstetrics. The services need scale and consequently a relatively large number of users to operate. Our aim here is to understand how the provision of these services will change as aging continues to increase and fertility rates continue to decrease in many countries. Next, please. And what we found, what we found is that outside cities, cost efficiency comes at the price of longer travel distances. And this balance clearly depends on the distribution of demand in space, not so much the levels of this demand. For instance, to achieve scale, we estimate that cardiology users in sparse rural areas in Ireland, that is a relatively young country and therefore has low demand for these services, have to travel 100 kilometers more than users in cities. Here it is important to realize that what matters is the population a facility serves, so these catchment areas that you see in the graph, and not the precise location of the facility. Because for instance, a facility located in a town that is serving a large sparse rural hinterland may struggle to achieve scale as much as a facility located in a rural area. Another very clear conclusion from the analysis is that the demand for, the, for different services is driven by different factors. And as demographic change continues, countries need to actively adapt the supply of different services in space. And if it is the case, they need to accompany the, con the concentration of services with more and better local provision of health services, for instance, those in primary care. Next, please. And finally, unlike the case of education, the demand for some services linked to aging, such as cardiology, is expected to increase in the future. For instance, uh, our estimates show that by 2035, the number of locations offering cardiology services will increase by 20%, and many of these will locate actually in rural areas. This is actually good news if it happens for people living in rural areas, because if more supplies follows more demand, then users outside cities, especially in remote areas, can actually get closer to the services. On the other hand, uh, the declining fertility rates in rural areas 
especially in countries such as Latvia and the Slovak Republic, means that users of maternity and obstetric services will have to travel longer distances to reach location in offering the services. In these cases, because we know there are negative effects of decreased access on health outcomes, policies need to consider complementary strategies that strive for efficiency, but at the same time work towards decreasing rural-urban gaps in access. With this, I, I finish the, the main outline of the results, and I give the floor now to my colleague, Mert, who will introduce you to our new interactive tool. Mert, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Hello to everyone. Uh, the tools developed uh, for this project uh, are currently used for tertiary analysis of sustainable mobility and accessibility, and they can also be made available uh, as a standalone decision support system in a later stage. Uh, now, the main results of the project uh, are available online uh, with the interactive maps and graphs, and as part of the Commission's Urban Data Platform Plus. Next slide, please. The platform is designed to explore geospatial data uh, used in the report and zoom into different countries and regions for policy assessment. Uh, it has the main uh, results of the annual cost and accessibility indicators developed uh, for education and health services. And you can download geospatial data using the report with several options provided, such as NUTS, uh, LAW, and GRID. Uh, then uh, you can match uh, and use this data with yours uh, using universal IDs uh, for specific regions provided. Uh, next slide, please. The platform has uh, interactive maps uh, designed for both annual cost and distance indicators for uh, each year's uh, estimation of present and future. And uh, you can zoom in, zoom out to regions and compare different scenarios and years. And it is also possible to see the maps at 10 square uh, kilometers grid level. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, graphs are also to explore the same indicators uh, interactively per country and this time per degree of urbanization. You can additionally see annual cost versus distance, for example, uh, per degree of urbanization in a separate graph. Uh, all these features and more can be seen at our dedicated page. Uh, we have included also a short video that describes main features of the platform. So thank you for listening. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Doro, I don't know if we have a couple of minutes, maybe. Yes, yes, maybe we can check. I mean, if there are uh, like immediate question on the on the presentation, maybe we, we can take uh, two minutes now. Okay, I see a question from uh, from Tamara. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think these are not related to specifically to the tool or technical issues. So we'll save these ones that are seem very good for, for the discussion in the Q&A. So I think we can move ahead, Doro, if you want with the- with Okay, oh, okay, very good. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Anna, Chris and Mert. And congratulations again uh, for the work. It's, it's really impressive work. It's a game changer, again, to be able to access the data at such a granular level in a forward-looking perspective. So our collective mission now is really to disseminate the report on the web tool as much as possible so that it is used by policymakers to better anticipate the changes and to identify some solutions uh, in advance. So we will now turn to the third part of this uh, event, which is the policy panel to discuss con uh, country experience on efficient uh, service provision in, uh, in rural uh, region. So I am very pleased to welcome in this panel our four uh, guests. Uh, so Tatiana Kilo, Head of the Analysis Department in the Ministry of Education and Research in Estonia. Sverke Lindblad, a Senior Advisor in the Division for Regional and Rural Development in the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation in, in Sweden. Uh, Josefina Montero Reyes, uh, Director of Rural Development Department in uh, Chile, and Tiet Ojafs, uh, who is Deputy Head of Department in the Ministry of Finance in, in Estonia. So the, the panel will last around uh, half an hour, and then we will have a bit of time at the end for a, a Q&A. 
So again, I remind the audience that you can use the Q&A function at the bottom and start asking uh, uh, your, your question and, and the panelists will, uh, will respond. So we will have two rounds of questions uh, and each speaker will, will have around uh, three minutes per question to, to, to respond. Um, the first round of questions will focus more on the tools for identifying the gaps in service provision. And the second one, uh, the second round will focus more on the, the policy solutions uh, that uh, your country has, uh, has experienced. So starting with the first uh, round, I would like to, to start maybe with, uh, with uh, Josefina in Chile. Uh, so in, in Chile, are there data systems uh, in place to identify people at risk of service under provision? access and cost of services and, and rural uh, urban quality gaps. Can, can you tell uh, us about the Chilean experience? Thank you, Dorothy, and thank you, everybody. Um, we're really happy to be here and, and share uh, the Chilean experience with, with other countries. And uh, related to this question, uh, Chile have recently approved a rural development national policy which seeks to improve the quality of life and opportunities of all the rural inhabitants. Uh, we have big gaps between rural and urban uh, municipalities when we talk about service provision. And it is fundamental for us to work in collaboration with the different public institutions and also with the private sector and the civil society to, uh, to uh, get, an, get little gaps in these services. Different national services uh, allow us to identify this kind of information, but we usually find the problem that they are not representative in rural levels. Part of the work we are doing uh, because of our rural policy is the creation of an indicator system of rural quality of life that is built with official information at municipalities level. This system gives us a territorial view of the rural areas in the four dimensions of the rural policy, the social welfare, economic opportunities, environmental sustainability, and culture and identity. Perhaps we can identify the access and quality of rural inhabitants to most of services provision with this new system. We hope to measure the impact of this public policy and its implementation. And also it is important to keep building more kind of data and grow in the representativeness of rural territories. So that's the, the big uh, things we have uh, related to data in, in Chile. Thank you very much, uh, Josefina. Very interesting to hear about this uh, new system. So I would like now to turn to, to Sweden, to Sverker. And Asking the, the same question, are there, what are the data systems in, in place in, in Sweden to, to identify the people at risk uh, of uh, service under provision and to track the urban rural divides? Uh, thank you, Dorothea. Uh, well, it's uh, basically two model systems that are important uh, in our analysis to see the demographic change and the challenges from that, but also to see accessibility to different service functions. First of all, we have an analysis and prognosis system uh, for economic and demographic projections at local and regional level. It works uh, well down to the level of local lab labor market regions. Uh, it can be used by both regional and national level actors. It actually has been used by the government to do, do long-term demographic analysis to see the effects of demographic change in a longer term future perspective. Uh, if we look at the results from that, it shows that the challenges will uh, clearly increase uh, in the future for at least 20 more years, especially if we look at rur rural and sparsely populated parts of Sweden. And it's especially the balance between the working age uh, population and the elderly population that gives uh, certain challenges uh, in those areas. Uh, the other system is uh, more of a calculation and mapping system to measure accessibility to different kinds of services. 
uh, both commercial services as grocery stores and, and pharmacies, but also public services as schools and, and healthcare. Uh, it's based on digitalized data on where people are living, uh, the location of these service uh, functions, and also travel times to the service functions. Um, it can also be used for calculations of uh, the most optimal location of service functions, uh, giving, given where, where people are actually living. Uh, in that respect, it's, it's quite close to what you showed in one of your slides before in the, in the pre presentation. Uh, it shows us uh, that it's uh, often quite uh, a correspondence between calculated uh, service locations and the reality where they are located. But uh, especially when, when it comes to schools at primary level, uh, uh, it's in sparsely populated parts of Sweden, a lot of such schools that are uh, kept because they have to be there. And th that was also said in one of your slides that it's many times too far travel distances for the, the smaller uh, students uh, to, uh, to schools if you close down the smallest one in sparsely populated areas. So it's not surprisingly that we have that situation, but it, it caused very much uh, extra costs for those municipalities. And that's, of course, a big, big challenge for those. Such municipalities that already have a, a very challenging situation from economy. economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sverker. Uh, very interesting to hear about these two models and the challenges uh, for Sweden. I will now turn to Tatiana in uh, Estonia. Uh, do you think uh, population projection help with the planning of uh, services such as uh, education? And does uh, Estonia use or intends to use projection to strategically plan service provision? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Actually, when we are uh, talking about uh, midterm planning of uh, education uh, provision um, in different areas, of course, not only uh, scarcely populated uh, or shrinking areas, but uh, also in the capital, for example, uh, we do use the, the projections. Uh, so we work closely with uh, um, the statistics Estonia, so with the system of uh, forecasting uh, uh, what would be the uh, demographics in the uh, in the mid midterm uh, period, as actually um, children uh, who uh, will start attending schools uh, in uh, six uh, years in Estonia, they are already born, actually. Or yeah, maybe, of course, they could be uh, some migration uh, from other countries, uh, increasing the demand for, uh, uh, for, for, for education or schooling places. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, migration, uh, which can also decrease the demand, but overall picture is um, something that we can uh, already use to forecast uh, the, uh, the demand uh, in different areas for schooling places. Uh, we also have... Uh, um, a forecast of uh, uh, for kind of for skills uh, of uh, skills needs. Uh, so, for example, when it comes to teaching profession and uh, other professionals, um, specialists work, working with children, uh, support, support specialists. Uh, so we use this kind of system to um, uh, to do the uh, forecast on uh, um, what would be the situation uh, in uh, the labor market for for teachers and uh, specialists uh, in the coming years. Uh, and uh, we do have a lot of this data, uh, but uh, what I would like to stress is that, uh, of course, the use of data is something uh, um, that maybe uh, kind of well, we should consider uh, as, uh, um, uh, for example, in Estonia with a very decentralized uh, education system where the school owners are local governments. Uh, it's uh, not maybe the question of availability of data, but the question of what would be the conclusions that uh, each and every local government would, uh, uh, would make uh, out of the data. And uh, sometimes uh, when looking at data, uh, uh, people can arrive uh, to very different uh, outcomes uh, in their judgment. Uh, so I would, what I would like to stress is that um, it's not about the availability of forecasts, but, but uh, uh, reaching the common grounds on decision making uh, in, uh, on different levels, so the local government level and uh, the uh, state level, for example, and the local governments uh, also as a kind of uh, 
um, owners of schools, if we don't have the common grounds uh, when making the decisions based on data, uh, then uh, the decisions could be very different. <laughs> so that's, um, um, I think these are the kind of uh, the same two, two sides of the same coin, actually, uh, uh, when we work with uh, uh, data for strategic uh, decision making. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana, and thank you for reminding that indeed it's not only about the availability of, of the data, but how they are actually shared and used and communicated across all levels of, uh, of, of government. And uh, I would like to, I think some of the practices that you, the data collection that you mentioned for Estonia are, are very inspiring for a number of uh, OECD countries. I would like to maybe follow up with uh, Josefina in, in Chile to, to understand uh, in Chile, uh, does Chile use a projection to, to plan a service provision? Well, I think that all kind of information is relevant when we talk about public policies and public services provision, because this is a guidance for the correct implementation of initiatives. And also it gives you an idea of the necessities of those territories. So it is easier to apply a bottom to top approach when you have uh, that information. We actually don't use projections in our rural policy for planning services deliver, but I think it is an important thing to incorporate because this gives solutions that are sustainable in the years and not just short-term uh, short solutions for some specific problems. You have that uh, view of future and, and you can uh, give solutions that are uh, going to work for many years. But also, I think that it's important to be careful with this kind of information because you have no certainties that the projection is the real thing that is going to happen. And I think in our country that we have a lot of uh, nature um, problems like earthquakes and uh, floods and all of that things. Um, uh, many times the things that you have projected are not the things that happen. So governments have to be resilient to change plans and provide the correct services when, when they are needed, uh, but also with this uh, view of future. Uh, so uh, the ideas that and the projects are sustainable in time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Josefina. Very important points indeed that you mentioned about the, the need of agility of governments. And we saw that, uh, I mean, with the pandemic, it's a clear uh, and obvious example. So uh, I would like now to, to follow up on this idea uh, mentioned by Tatiana and the, the need for coordination and exchange across levels of government and also at the central level uh, across ministry. And to ask maybe Tit in, uh, in Estonia, do you think there is enough uh, coordination and data sharing to inform service provision across ministries, but also across levels of government and agency? And if not, what needs to be changed? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And congratulations on, uh, on starting this uh, new stream of work. I think it's uh, really good that you have taken this up, uh, the OECD, and then good luck with this really, really tricky question. Uh, but as for your question, um, I think that's that's clearly a challenge because, uh, as uh, Tatiana also uh, presented on the Estonian case uh, related to education, I think the sectors are doing very good job. Uh, they have the analysis tools uh, quite often. Also, projections are used. Uh, the spatial tools are also used. Uh, what uh, what I would like to highlight is is the horizontality or, or the the need for integrated uh, for an integrated approach. Uh, that's uh, what I guess is I'm missing also in Estonia somewhat. So when uh, Sverker mentioned that uh, there's a uh, an online tool uh, available in Sweden that uh, that lists the different uh, services private or or public that is something that we actually don't have as such uh, in estonia and uh, al although we have to have many um, 
different uh, like monitoring portals for, uh, on the local municipality level and on, on the spatial levels, which are which are really good. And then you can uh, use them also to, to nudge uh, the local municipalities to increase or, or to better the service provision. But uh, I think the the horizontality of uh, of of the uh, issue is is something that uh, that is at, at least tricky in Estonia, because uh, the sec sectors uh, have the financing, of course, and have uh, have the their own goals, and it's totally understandable that uh, that these also are very relevant. But uh, these should be solved in a in a horizontal matter, and uh, when. Uh, when we talk about the spatial approach, then I think uh, uh, s somehow it feels that uh, the spatial positioning of services is is sort of nobody's uh, priority, and it is at the same time everybody's priority. So everybody's trying to uh, to to advance their own like sector sectoral services, but at least in Estonia, there's uh, it's it's quite hard to to appoint that someone who could uh, take the lead in, in, in trying to horizontally combine the spatial needs of different networks of uh, service provision. And then uh, on the local municipality level, there's at least in the rural and also remote urban municipalities, there is a, the capac capacity problem definitely. So it's, it's, we cannot assume that uh, the local municipalities always can uh, handle these quite uh, complex problems. So um, yeah, of, of course, networking, uh, if, if you ask about uh, solutions, networking be between local municipalities, um, multi-level governance uh, instruments also in the sense that uh, not, not just engaging different levels of governance, but, uh, but also the stakeholders. So there are many examples from Estonia also from, from including the private sector in, in, in various uh, service provision. And then so it is, it is getting there, but uh, what I'm lacking is the horizontal coordination in this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tit. So I, I suggest there are a few few questions. Uh, I suggest we, we take maybe uh, two now and then we'll continue with the, the second round and uh, with a, an, an another uh, set of, of questions. So there is a question which is for all the, the, the panelists. Um, has the pandemic changed rural population demographic trends to any significant degree in some places? Uh, so, so I don't know if uh, one or all of you want to 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 address this. Um, and and then another question on um, how can local government trust on this projection and change uh, investment strategy based on on them? So maybe you can, uh, and this is also for all uh, panelists. Uh, so maybe you can cover one or, or two or. As you as you wish, if uh, one or I, all of you. I want to. I can start <laughs> uh, maybe with the first question. Uh, I think that in Chile we have uh, many people have moved from urban territories to rural territories during the pandemic, and I think that the principal um, issue that this uh, made us um, to work in is the connectivity, the digital connectivity. Um, because it's the only way that actually you can you can get to your work, to edu education, to health. So I think that it is kind of a, a future thing that we have uh, to to take care of, uh, because uh, I think it's going to be like a big solution for for this demographic change. Uh, when you will not be able to provide services in in remote places with very low population, but you have uh, this big solution that is, uh, it's cheaper than, than have the service like physically. So I think this uh, made us like change priorities and, and work on uh, better connectivity uh, solutions for, for our rural areas. Thank you, Josefina. There are another panelist who wants to address the, the question. Well, I can also uh, 
uh, reflect on, on the question on pandemic because it's quite interesting. In the short term, I think that it will not affect very much the very remote regions of Sweden. Uh, those areas that will be uh, affected and, and maybe have some possibilities out from the pandemic is those little, a little longer distances from bigger cities. Uh, we can already now see that uh, the, the, the migration patterns uh, have, have shown that. Uh, also um, uh, looking for houses and, and, and uh, uh, maybe living in secondary homes have, have increased very much in those areas. Uh, but another interesting thing with, with the pandemic is that we actually have had a full-scale experiment with distance, uh, distance learning and distance schools uh, that have been practiced. And, and um, uh, maybe the experiences uh, in Sweden at least have not been so uh, positive uh, from that because it seems like the physical presence are quite important, especially when, when it comes to, to the smaller students, uh, but also when it comes to secondary level schools, uh, it's very easy for, for, for them to, to lay in bed and, and play computer games when they are at home at the whole, whole time. But um, where it seems to uh, function quite well is if there can be combinations that, that have, have some, some kind of, of, of teaching uh, help uh, at the same time as some uh, are, are done on distance. That might be a be solution that could also uh, take uh, with us for the future. Thank you very much, uh, Sverker. Mm -hmm. Very interesting uh, points indeed. Mm -hmm. Tatiana, do you want to react? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to end of course, to echo or to, uh, to add uh, to what has already been said that um, very similar trends. Uh, so uh, again, it's a very small country actually. So when we talk about uh, distances, uh, uh, it, it, it can roughly in uh, two hours um, or three hours drive, you can uh, kind of reach from capital whatever uh, place in Estonia we have, maybe except for islands, uh, which requires a bit more uh, a different type of transportation. But um, in general, yes, this uh, actually um, this distance uh, working and uh, remote working uh, um, and also learning, uh, it showed that uh, um, uh, this uh, kind of uh, how to say the uh, highlighted the device in the uh, in the way uh, we work and in the also the so in the service provisions. For example, in learning and education, what we have kind of content-wise, what we experience is that uh, uh, students uh, uh, with a high degree of um, uh, self-management or how to say self-driven uh, uh, attitudes uh, in uh, learning that they actually succeeded also in uh, distance learning uh, quite well. Uh, but the uh, kids or students uh, with a weaker social economic background, uh, um, uh, with, uh, for example, weaker parental uh, support, uh, and um, uh, they uh, uh, are those. Uh, they were those who actually um, required uh, much more help and attention from uh, uh, from teachers. And uh, this kind of students, they do need really the kind of a presence of teacher, and they do need also the routine of. Uh, uh, kind of a contact uh, um, way of uh, learning and uh, 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 the classmates and uh, all this uh, social part of, uh, of, of schooling. And uh, uh, that's why actually it also so showed that uh, service could not be instrumental. Uh, so it's not something that you have in your Excel table with uh, numbers and figures um, um, and uh, indicators on efficiency, but uh, uh, kind of the content wise, uh, this kind of the uh, the content-wise approach is uh, very, very important, and uh, that it's actually in every service you all, all, always have the social contact part uh, or kind of communication part, and uh, maybe it's kind of in Excel tables you cannot see these things, but uh, but in reality for people it's very important, and it's something uh, kind of the part of the quality of education that uh, people kind of tell to us that uh, uh, we do need this uh, because this is important for us and for our kids. So this was, uh, yeah, um, um, a kind of a really, um, how to say, um, a different way of uh, learning about what we are doing every day. And uh, for policymakers, um, uh, hard times, but um, 
kind of very difficult lessons to learn, but I, I do hope that this would uh, help us uh, um, uh, to kind of better decisions and uh, to, to listen more to also this qualitative uh, um, how to say, approach or uh, uh, kind of value-based decision-making uh, um, in, in, in the questions that we're discussing now. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Very, very good points. Uh, thank you very much, to Tatiana. And I see that Tit uh, raised his hand, so... Yeah, Tit. I'm sorry, just uh, shortly. Uh, I think uh, what's been already said is very true. And, and uh, I think what the pandemic situation uh, indicated, that at least in Estonia, is the complexity of, of, uh, of actually uh, determining where to offer services and where the people actually are. Because as Verka as also mentioned, it's, uh, it's quite uh, common also for Estonia to have second homes. And it's, it, we're trying to find data on this as well, uh, working with the OECD and with Anna and, 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 and the co other colleagues. So, uh, uh, but, uh, but especially the ones who, who basically are better off and have the choice uh, to to have second homes and uh, can decide to perhaps send spend most of the summer or, or weekends or wherever. So it's it's quite tricky to design a service network uh, in this situation. And I think uh, the the pandemic uh, also indicated that if 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 people have the choice, they 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 can just simply decide to live in another location for some time. So, and, but it's from a policy point of view, it's, it's quite a compli complex situation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, very good uh, summary of the challenges that the governments are, are facing uh, now. So I would like now to move to the second round. We have a bit less than 20 minutes for the second round of questions, which focuses more on the, on the policy solutions and the what are the solutions and the tools to ensure adequate service provision in the context of decentralization and intermunicipal uh, cooperation? And do the solutions come from the national, the regional, the local communities, uh, private actors, civil, civil society? To, so to, to get a bit uh, your, your points of view uh, on, on this. So maybe I, I can start with uh, Sverker. In, in Sweden, uh, what is the experience of Sweden in, in recent years to to best promote economies of scale and innovation in public service delivery in health and education at the local level and, and, and promote intermunicipal uh, cooperation in public service delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Well, um, if you talk to uh, municipalities and regions on how they can strengthen their capacity to provide services to their inhabitants, they always come up with the most two uh, low hanging fruits here. And it seems to be uh, cooperation with their neighbors and uh, secondly, uh, digitalization and e-services. And um, it's a tendency that you always see the upside of this coin and not the downside. Um, of course, the cooperation uh, gives uh, economies of scale if it's done right. Uh, and, and that's very, very good. So you can do a lot from, out from cooperation to share a different type of specialist services, for instance, between municipalities and so on. Uh, in Sweden, it's used very much also when it comes to secondary schools. Uh, even though secondary schools are uh, a municipality responsibility, not all small municipalities have secondary schools. And especially when it comes to more specialized education in secondary level schools, then it's always traveling across borders uh, to solve this uh, situation. So that's very common. And also when it comes to specialist services in healthcare, it's very common to, to, to uh, have cooperation. But the downside here is that it's many times not so clear that it takes a lot of time and resources to have good cooperation between parts, partners. Time uh, also is uh, critical when it comes to, to find the right partners, to have trust between the partners. It's also a problem when it comes to uh, uh, 
changes over time. It could be a, a change in political leadership in one of the municipalities and the basis for the cooperation can uh, go away with that or a different economic development in, in municipalities. That's also a, a challenge here. It's also a challenge out from, from democratic point of view. It's not always clear for inhabitants in, in a municipality who is responsible if the other another municipalities are doing tasks in, in, in the even though uh, the, the, the principle is clear that it's the home municipalities that are, are responsible. Uh, so uh, it takes a lot of time and resources and time is also clear uh, challenge to, to, to handle. Uh, it's also limitation when it comes to public procurement uh, because some of some services can also uh, uh, come from from private actors and uh, due to laws on public public procurement you have to to uh, take care of also the private sector in this respect when it comes to digitalization it's uh, quite a lot the same problem that it, it takes a lot of time and resources it, it needs a very clear convictions from the political leadership and the, the leadership in municipalities and regions that now we should should go into digitalization as a possibility and the big potential here lies in if we can use uh, digitalization and e-services uh, in in the actual operation, not only in admi administration, as that is the case in many places right now, but it should also uh, go into operational uh, services uh, in healthcare, in schools, and so on. But also here, it's um, not always that you can use these sol solutions when the physical presence are quite good. And as I said before. The pandemic has show, showed us also the downside on, on, on these solutions. It's not easy. Uh, it maybe can be done better uh, if we ha have been better prepared to do it. So that's some re reflections from my side. Thank you very much, uh, Sberger, for, for reminding uh, indeed the, the complexity and the challenges in, in cooperation. Too often we forget about the cost also that go with, uh, with uh, cooperation and, and coordination indeed. So I would like now to turn to Estonia and uh, Tit. Um, a key question, of course, is, is uh, how to take into account the cost related to, to smallness, to, to remoteness in public service delivery. So I would like to ask you as the representative of the Ministry of Finance of uh, Estonia, um, what is the situation in, in Estonia? Uh, how do funding formulas, for example, for education and health, take into account possible cost of uh, smallness uh, uh, in Estonia? Yeah, thank you for, for the record. Uh, I'm, I'm working at the spatial planning department at the Ministry of Finance, but uh, but I do have some information on this. So uh, I think uh, it's um, there are uh, the sectors, all of the sectors, I think, or many of the sectors are are doing this themselves, and perhaps Tatiana can uh, can help we with this uh, in the education field. But uh, but there, I think many sectors are doing this somehow, including. Uh, uh, remoteness or or the smallness in their formulas and also uh, from 2018 uh, uh, the local municipality equalization formula the, the national formula to distribute uh, funding uh, redistribute uh, funding among uh, local municipalities uh, that's used i think in many countries and also in estonia uh, in in that formula it was also included uh, the let's say the rurality uh, uh, component or, or, or index or something. And uh, although it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, address shrinking as such, it's, it's, uh, it's like this, the sparsity of, of the population rather. So, uh, so more rural uh, municipalities uh, have a slightly bigger index so therefore get some uh, like additional funding uh, based on this but it's it's only been uh, two years experience basically so there's not many reflections on on whether uh, how well this has worked or or how happy people are with this uh, solution and also in the 
uh, in the sector of, of uh, social or, or basically primary health, primary health care. Uh, just uh, I think it was last year. The uh, they hold uh, the sector also has like a, a, a remoteness benefit or 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 some kind of a coefficient, uh, and that was increased actually um, uh, many times. So, but I think there's as with many sectors, there's like the uh, it's a, it's basically a crisis because it's uh, it's uh, it's very hard to offer the services in in these uh, remote areas if if you don't have any benefits. So it, it might be my financial in, uh, benefits, or, but it might also might be that the local municipality, for instance, uh, finds uh, the uh, that like the built environment or the built uh, infrastructure, the the houses, the the rooms that are used, and and offers these for free for they do it. So it might be quite different uh, ways of supporting these uh, services, but it's also done centrally. Yes. But Tatiana, maybe would like you like to add something? Thanks, yes. Uh, yes, in education, the kind of the funding form for, for uh, running costs, uh, it also takes into account the smallness um, uh, so that uh, no, in Estonia, regularly the remote schools, they are also small schools. Uh, so it's um, um, kind of not uh, very common that you have a kind of, how to say, remote area, a rural area uh, and a large school. <laughs> so it's uh, usually, uh, they are kind of go hand in hand. Uh, so the smallness and uh, remoteness. And uh, actually uh, the um, uh, situation now is that yes, for the uh, uh, kids, uh, grades uh, one to uh, six, uh, uh, go to kind of first stage and second stage. So this one, uh, the first grade to sixth grade, uh, uh, the former actually, um, and also the legislation allows to have uh, um, kind of special solutions where you have really small uh, classes. And uh, um, so the teacher salary and everything is actually um, kind of guaranteed and uh, funded. Uh, and uh, uh, in, but from the policy and also from the uh, perspective and also from the quality uh, considerations, uh, uh, we have uh, we are now kind of finishing the uh, reform of school uh, network where we uh, supported the um, how to say the centralization of the upper secondary education. Uh, so upper secondary, the grades uh, ten to twelve, it's not the compulsory level, so it's after the basic education, and uh, uh, for uh, for this uh, uh, for, for this reform, we actually assumed that there should be uh, at least one uh, uh, state upper secondary school in uh, each uh, county, so in each region, and uh, uh, that it should actually be um, uh, kind of a large institution uh, in terms of uh, the number of students uh, and the offering of uh, elective courses and uh, uh, actually with a kind of different uh, how to say that, uh, so that there should be some choices uh, uh, among the subjects and uh, uh, specialization at, the, at, at this level. And uh, uh, in this reform, we worked very closely uh, uh, with uh, all local governments. Uh, so this uh, kind of things for this kind of reform, we um, uh, kind of had uh, always the agreement uh, under the how to say the project, uh, so that uh, we agreed together with local governments so that. Uh, uh, we would consolidate the upper secondary education uh, and uh, the local governments would uh, focus and get investments uh, to, um, uh, to invest into the basic education uh, 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 schools and network. Uh, it's uh, maybe a bit early to talk about the outcomes uh, as we are kind of in the proce process of finishing this, um, uh, this reform. Uh, but um, I think that in five, seven years, uh, we will see the, uh, the results. But again, when we started planning this, of course, the situation, the demographic situation was not so kind of harsh, but uh, uh, already you know, 10 years ago, we saw that if we look at the forecasts uh, of what would be the number, numbers of, number of young people in the areas, that this kind, of, this kind of change or some kind of steps, they are inevitable. Otherwise, uh, it would be really very difficult to have uh, kind of to continue provision of high quality upper secondary education, which is expected to prepare for higher education in really small places and really remote schools, because they would be just number of kids uh, or students wouldn't be enough to um, uh, to provide uh, and to, to have uh, all the teachers places covered uh, and uh, also like specialized teachers uh, with uh, uh, kind of focusing on the concrete subjects or subject areas. 
Um, so yes, this uh, um, again, these are kind of the value-based uh, decisions. Uh, so we, uh, we um, Estonia, uh, in Estonian education strategy, we say that uh, uh, this uh, the beginning of education uh, uh, pathway. Uh, so the first uh, uh, six grades, at least, uh, they should be uh, close to home. Uh, uh, possibly, kind of how to say, more comfortably accessible by kids and by, by their parents, uh, so that they should be really kind of, uh, they could be, might be very small schools, uh, but uh, located close to homes. Uh, but with the uh, kind of with this age and uh, increasing difficulty of curricula and kind of when curricula become more demanding, uh, also in terms of teachers and infrastructure, then we see that uh, at some point the kind of there should be some centralization of uh, of school network, so just to have this quality also quality setup guaranteed. Uh, so, but this is a yeah, step by step and uh, based also the content wise considerations of what, what is required for uh, high quality education. Thank you very much, uh, Tatiana. Very interesting to to hear about the the Estonian experience and the, uh, I think fiscal equalization systems are. are uh, are a good way to take into account the, the differences in the, for the small and, and remote municipalities. But, but of course, we know that there is a strong inertia in uh, reforming fiscal equalization. And it's, uh, it's also uh, uh, sometimes uh, very, very challenging. I would like to ask um, Chile, Josefina, um, do you think to to go back a bit to this question of having differentiated fiscal or government governance tools to, to adapt to specific conditions of uh, rural, remote, uh, small municipalities. Do you think small municipalities that are projected to become smaller require a, require a differentiated governance or a fiscal approach for public service delivery? Thank you, Dorothy. Well, first of all, I think that the Chilean reality, it's a little bit different from the European. In our country, we have a 263 rural and mixed municipalities. Um, this is uh, the 83% of our territory and uh, the 25% of the Chilean population lives in these places. So I think we're not still facing like these extreme small municipalities that you have uh, in Europe. Uh, even though we, we, we have to face problems like the aging population and uh, the lack of capacities in most of these municipalities uh, that uh, don't let them uh, project um, different things and and develop uh, innovate, innovative projects in their municipalities. Um, when we talk about um, how we take uh, into account the remote, remoteness in the public service delivery in our country, uh, we have a social evaluation system um, for all the public uh, projects and initiatives that uh, are developed in our country. Uh, and this uh, evaluation have a different approach when we talk about remoteness and remote places. The evaluation is usually centered in cost benefits, uh, but in rural cases and in basic services, uh, they are measured with cost efficiency so that they can assure that the delivery of that service in that specific sector, um, just taking care that it's like the cheaper one. Um, in other hand, in Chile, we have a national policy for lagging zones uh, that is uh, developed by the um, uh, interior minister uh, that are um, is related with the rural remote areas. Uh, this policy seeks to provide services in these areas by focusing resources in uh, these uh, lagging sectors. This policy works uh, by identifying this needed sector and uh, they elaborate a development plan uh, that is uh, after um, is validated by the regional authority. Um, finally, uh, I think it is very important to promote uh, the, municip the municipalities associations because most of the rural ones have uh, the same problems and, and necessities. So if they talk 
uh, and they share uh, their capacities and work for solutions together. Um, I think this kind of collaborative work is a great solution for smaller municipalities uh, that usually lack of human capacities and uh, like specific specialties. Um, and it's something that we are promoting in our country and we have a, already a good, um, good experience with that. Thank you very much, uh, Josefina. Uh, so we are running a bit, um, we are a bit short in time. So I think uh, there are a few questions. I'm not sure we will, uh, we will be able to, to address all of this, uh, maybe all of them maybe. Uh, like uh, there is one targeted for uh, Sweden, uh, which says the report findings has implication for territorial equalization uh, policy, as we discussed. Are there any leading uh, practices, for example, in, in, in Sweden? So I don't know, Sverker, if you want just in, in one minute. But <laughs> just. just one reflection on the equalization system. Uh, we have a very developed such system in Sweden, uh, but still we can see that it not taking account of all the uh, structural differences that we have in, in oh, also growing stru structural differences between smaller municipalities and bigger municipalities. So um, actually there are suggestions for uh, having a, a, a big uh, uh, inquiry on, on the whole system once again and, and see if we should take account on, on all the structural uh, differences that we actually see as we all of them we, we have discussed here today, or many of them at least. So that, that's just one reflection on, on this equalization. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sverker. Uh, so to, to finish, uh, I think I would like just to ask you in, in, in one minute or less, uh, if you have uh, one or two takeaways or recommendations that you would like to, to flag to improve uh, service delivery in all regions, what would this be? So we can start, I don't know, Tatiana, for example. What I actually kind of took out from today's session is um, an ex example from Sweden, uh, where you have, uh, uh, how to say, a whole system services approach uh, to monitoring. Uh, so just to kind of try to understand uh, from the perspective of a family, what are different services uh, that a family might, may kind of need to use and uh, how to, say, to work together with other um, uh, ministries and services uh, in uh, kind of making, uh, uh, how to say, the, of optimizing the way that we, um, or changing even the way that uh, these services are delivered. Uh, uh, but for this, I think, yes, we kind of need, kind of, how to say, a big picture and uh, understanding of, um, from this a person centered or family centered approach to uh, planning of uh, services. Uh, this, I think, something from Sweden that um, uh, we would. Uh, would like to have a closer look at how to, to do the mapping and uh, monitoring. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, Tiet? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, one thing I would like to highlight is that we shouldn't uh, forget uh, the importance of uh, small urban uh, centers. So I think if we talk about service provision, then uh, we must bear in mind that the, the remote urban areas are also shrinking, but they are of key importance uh, in, in service provision in, in remote areas. So thank, that's, that's one thing I think we should uh, always bear in mind that it's, it's not uh, rural that is shrinking, it's also the smaller urban areas. And, and another, another thing that uh, it's always, it's quite tricky when you look from a policy, uh, policy level, but uh, uh, the, uh, when, we, when we use the word uh, spatial, uh, spatial, I don't know, interventions or spatial uh, approach, then we actually need to go quite low. We actually need to look at the buildings as well. So we have to combine different services in one building and then we have to look at the long-term sustainability of, of the investments in these uh, 
places and so on. So that's it. it uh, the spatial dimension is also it's it can be at at, uh, at the regional level, but it has to be at also at the quite local level. But thank you. Thank you for this uh, discussion also. Thank you very much, Kit. Sverker? Uh, well, I think there's still uh, quite a potential within cooperation that could be be used. Uh, and uh, I think it must be more strategic, uh, meaning that it should be better based on analysis who to cooperate with, what issues to cooperate around that gives the most added value, uh, what cooperation forms that are the best, and of course to give uh, resources uh, to uh, this kind of, of, of cooperation. And the second recommendation, I think, have very much to do with the multi-level governance system and, and, and strengthen those systems to actually uh, that actually the state and the regions can take on their roles as support supporting the municipalities, especially the rural municipalities, when it comes to cooperation, but especially when it comes to digitalization and 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 potential in in that because the smaller ones don't really have the capacity and competence in that area. So that's my, my point. Thank you very much, Zerker. And Josefina? Well, very quick. I think that the construction of indicators uh, to collect valuable information is fundamental for a correct delivery of solutions and services. And on the second hand, I think that uh, the digital connectivity can bring us a lot of solutions when we talk about um, demographic change and delivering services to remote areas. So I think it, it's important to, to work in improving that service uh, so that can give you other services with it. Thank you, Josefina, and thank you really to, to all of you for sharing all these very interesting uh, insights in this uh, policy panel. Thank you, I, I've learned uh, a lot. Uh, so we'll now uh, turn to, to the last part of, uh, of this event, so the closing uh, remarks. Uh, before that, I just would like to, to flag that at the OECD, uh, this work will, uh, will uh, remain a top priority. Uh, we'll, uh, we are developing a full work stream on preparing regions for demographic change. And we are also currently conducting a number of projects to help countries address the challenges, the de demographic challenges at, at stake in, in regions. So we intend to to continue this, uh, the quantitative work and, and developing an analytical tools to support forward-looking planning strategies. So we look forward to continuing working with you on that. With this, I will now turn to Sabrina Lucatelli, uh, Vice Chair of the Working Party of Rural Policy uh, of the, at the OECD. Sabrina, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for inviting me and for asking me to conclude this uh, important workshop. Um, you, you know that I've been following this project since uh, the very beginning, so I want to thank a lot to ECD, GRC and European Union. I think that this is an extremely important afternoon today because we knew that uh, uh, providing services was costing more in remote areas, but we now have a set of numbers, statistics, and we have an important report coming from OECD uh, informing us that 35% of people living in Europe are living in shrinking remote areas and, and that you know, we are expecting uh, schooling services costing around 20% higher in those areas. Those are important numbers that we have to put on the table of policymakers and we have to work on with statistics, but not only also in, in making a sort of better use of those statistics. statistics. We have a very good knowledge of a number of phenomena. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to OECD and to many uh, important researching uh, centers. We now need to translate this knowledge 
in better policies. So I expect this work going on. This was today for me a first for, for me and the, the group I represent today here was a, a first confrontation. I do expect going inside of those issues. We know that location of services is an issue. We know that we have to take the right decision when we, we locate services. We, we have a new concept of inevitable cost. Inevitable cost is an important concept. We know that we have to work with these limitations, cost. We, we see very clearly the trade-off between distance and, and cost and then equity. So those are three important concepts that deserve the best possible policies. So one other message I want to, to send today to the all people listening to this uh, important afternoon is the question of, uh, of uh, uh, complexities of rural policies. Rural policies are complex. Okay, those are fragile, remote, northeast territories. Cooperation in between municipalities is not spontaneous. Okay, it needs to be accompanied and needs to, 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 to work a lot. I was very frightened by, by um, uh, the Sweden uh, concept, very clear concept of how difficult it is to, to make participation going on, to make collaboration, and also the political argument, which is absolutely true. I mean, we, we did this, this municipality, they change mayors, they change you know political political equilibrium and then you know each time we need to restart again so i think we need a, we need a, a schema we need a let's say we need a strategy which is we are a part we are working you know you know very well seriously in my country in, in, a, in a national strategy we need more and more in european strategy and OECD strategy because these remote areas in, in needs we need to rebuild trust. We didn't talk too much about this, uh, this, 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 um, this important key word today, but uh, a better equity, uh, being able to provide the best possible services to those citizens means a way to rebuild the, the trust in, in, in the citizens of, of those areas. And it is a, an important equilibrium also for social political equilibrium of Europe and, uh, and of all the OECD countries. A, a last point is in administration capacity, which is a crucial point. When we talk about uh, projections, using projections, using statistics. We, we all have to invest in very good administrations at central, regional and local level. So the quality of administration is a crucial point in, this, in the argument we are uh, doing today. And then the last point is on uh, understanding how, I mean, those kind of policies are difficult to to, to build up and to work in the territories. Just two arguments, consolidation. Consolidation as of schools is very difficult. The mayors, they tend, they want, each mayor want to keep his school. So if we have to, to go through this concept, we have from one side to take into consideration the geographical aspects and from the other side, you know, accompanying and seeing that I mean, it's such a difficult decision is a part of the country decision to improve the, the wellness of the whole citizen. So we can we don't have to leave them alone to take such difficult decision. First part. Second part, maternity. We know that we, we are expecting having less kids, but we cannot invest you know, in rural policy in, in you know, a small equilibrated world, in a better distributed people in, in different countries without you know, finding solutions, hot spots, hospital, doctors moving, you know, we have to invent, we have to innovate, but we have to, to, to be, to, 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 we have to guarantee to a young woman living in a remote areas to being able to, to have a, a good pregnancy and to have birth to his kids. So this is a crucial aspect. Thanks a lot for to OECD. I put all the availability and uh, you know the willingness of Italy to work with you to go on in the in this uh, activity and for sure of the, the group I represent today thank you thank you very much uh, Sabrina and uh, and now last but not least for the final words I give the floor to Lewis Jekstra uh, who is the head of the economic analysis sector in the director general for regional and urban policy in the European Commission Lewis has launched and supported this work from the OECD and GRC uh, since the beginning. 
So Lewis, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dorothée. Um, I really enjoyed this workshop. It's been the culmination of uh, quite a few years of work. And what I love most about this workshop is that we're looking at things from multiple perspective, right? We're not looking at education and healthcare as a way of reducing costs. We're looking at it to find a balance between costs and proximity, accessibility, making sure we provide a, a, a good proximity to everybody. Uh, in, in our territories. We're not looking just at the situation today, but we're looking at the changes that are to come. We're looking at the situation tomorrow. We know certain changes will happen. We think we know which other changes will happen. You know, the, the, the age composition of your population today already tells you a lot about what you can expect tomorrow, you know. If you don't have any kids between zero and 10 now, well, guess what? You're not gonna have any teenagers in 10 years from now. You know? Some things are relatively predictable. And it's, it's important to think that through because we're all in our own way in charge of long-term policy, long-term investments and thinking about how to improve a, a better quality of life. We looked at density, we looked at remoteness, We've got the accompanying policy report, which I recommend you look at as well, looking at how we can combine face-to-face -face with online uh, education or healthcare to kind of help that um, along. I also wanted to highlight one more point. Um, I really thought the, the slide showing both the situation and from a point of view, the size of a settlement, looking at the degree of urbanization and towns and villages on the one hand, and combining that with looking at the size of municipalities, political entities is, is very important. Um, Sabrina already mentioned that there is a lot of political obstacles to consolidation of schools. I would argue that the political obstacles to consolidating municipalities is gonna be even bigger because it's not just the mayor who loses his school, but the mayor loses his or her job. And that, that of course is controversial always, and that won't happen easily and it won't necessarily happen without a big discussion. But I do think we need to invest in capacity uh, at that local level, we need to make them stronger. We need to make sure that they have enough staff and specialized staff. And that's gonna be really hard if these places are really small. Um, you know, and in Sweden, uh, even there where the municipalities are quite a bit larger, still for certain services, you need to cooperate, but it would be great that they at least have a certain minimum size to kind of help them deliver that kind of capacity uh, uh, to manage these services. Then, then two last points. Um, I thought the, the interest in the projections uh, was varied. I think also a very good point was made by Chile that projections are not certain. And it's important to look at, at you know, variance, uh, different projections. Eurostat produces a number of scenarios. Um, you know, there's a central one, but there's one where we assume lower or higher fertility or no migration. Uh, and that can kind of give you an indication of like, well, are we relatively sure it's going to go this way or very sure? And that can kind of help us to understand and use those projections in, in our local and our regional plans. But I really think it, it's crucial to do so. But it is something that not all local administrations are, are experienced doing so. And this is why I think this online visualization tool is so, so useful and so important that people can actually see what uh, the consequences are for their area and they can zoom in on the places that they're interested in because otherwise it becomes you know, abstract and, and, and difficult to, to understand. My last takeaway from this uh, workshop is the need to get better data on the location, not just the public services, but also of private services. And this is difficult, this is challenging, this is not uh, uh, something that we have readily available. Sorry. Um, and so we need to find ways of doing that in a way that we can reliably know when does a service open, when did it shut down, we can't rely on commercial providers which just list all the services that have been present in a building and have no clue which ones are still there. You know, we, we need to have a more rigorous tried and tested approach to identifying 
uh, these services, particularly in remote and rural areas where commercial providers may have less of an incentive to make the necessary investments. So I really think that's critical. Now, I've talked too much. Wanted to close off with some positive news. Um, Teed mentioned the importance of smaller urban settlements, and I couldn't agree more. These can often be anchor points, key locations for access to services. And that's why I'm very happy to announce another joint project with the OECD on the role of smaller urban settlements in uh, the wider rural and regional development of a region. So there we're going to be looking at, do these smaller settlements, if they really are a regional center, are they more likely to provide services and how can we build a policy around that to improve access to services uh, for everybody? That's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lewis, and thank you for the finishing with this good news. So thank you all for your participation. Uh, the meeting is now over. I wish you all a very good evening or rest of the day. Thank you.